Let's look at God's Word together. We're going to be studying our continued uh, depth of insight, hopefully, and study into the book of Ephesians. We're working our way through the entire book. Today, we're just going to do five verses. I want to give us, again, some little bit of background, uh, if I can, on the city of Ephesus and a little bit about the Apostle Paul and his writing of this tremendous letter. The city of Ephesus was a place where the Apostle Paul not only brought the Word of God, but actually helped to form a church there. After Paul preached there and had his study there, Apollos, this great preacher, also went there and preached God's Word. So it wasn't just the Apostle Paul, it was also Apollos. And then after that, Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus, and Timothy ministered there as well. Now, this city was so important to the early church that finally the Apostle John, who was the last of the apostles to live, when he was imprisoned in Patmos, he had view, this was a little island way out, which was a prison. John was imprisoned there, but after his imprisonment, he decided that he would go to Ephesus, and he actually finished his whole ministry in Ephesus, probably died in Ephesus, went to the throne of God from Ephesus. Now, after Paul and Apollos and Timothy and the apostle John had ministered there, When their ministry was over, shortly thereafter, wouldn't you know it, the city diminished, and soon after that was left deserted. So the ministry was there, the city was flourishing, and the gospel was going out, but it finally ended. Ephesus soon diminished and was deserted. Now, the Ephesian letter that we're studying, and again, we're going to be studying this for a long time, The Ephesian letter was probably also taken to the Laodicean church. And that's very important as we talk about this later, about the Laodicean church and we as the people of God studying Ephesians. So you'll see why as we get deeper into this. But it was probably taken not just to Ephesus, but also to Laodicea and a number of different churches received the ability to look at this letter. Now, Paul was in prison from 59 AD to 61. He was about three years, two and a half, three years in prison, and he wrote this letter during his first imprisonment. Now, he had another disciple, not just Timothy, Paul had a number of them, but another disciple that his name was Jaikaikas, and Jaikaikas took the letter to the Ephesians from the prison where Paul was in Rome. Paul was in prison in Rome, so he took the letter to Ephesus. Now, Paul wrote a number of letters during his first imprisonment. He wrote another one during his second imprisonment, which was 2 Timothy. But during his first imprisonment, he wrote Ephesians, and Jachikas took this out to the different churches, but he also took out Colossians and also took out Philemon, these letters that Paul had written. Now, it's significant as we look at this spectacular letter, this epistle of the Apostle Paul, it's significant that Paul's longest ministry was in Ephesus. He was actually there for three years. And while he was there, one of the things he did was he baptized, can you imagine this? He baptized John the Baptist's disciples. 12 of them, a dozen of them, he baptized while he was in Ephesus. So you'd think the Baptist would take care of baptizing all his disciples, but there were a few out there that joined Paul in Ephesus, and Paul took them through the waters of baptism. Now this letter, before we get into a little more, I want to say this phrase, because this has been called, quote, the crown of Paul's writings. And that is a heavy statement. When you think that Paul wrote most of the New Testament, that this is called the crown of Paul's writings. 
So let's look at Ephesians. Would you stand with me, if you will? Let's look and and stand together as we read from Ephesians, the first chapter. And again, I'm just going to read these five verses, but they are so packed. They are so full. But let's look at Ephesians 1, starting with verse 7, and we'll read down verse through verse 11. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. By the way, this is the title of this message called Lavish Redemption, and I'm getting it from verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. What does that say a lot? That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, plural, and things upon the earth. Verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. You may be seated within God's wonderful word. Oh, I'm just so thankful for the Apostle Paul in this tremendous, tremendous letter. Let's look at verse 7. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood. The blood, the blood, the blood is the dividing point of all humanity. His blood is where it all divides. Redemption is not through Islam. Redemption is not through being a good person. It's not through money. It's not through success. It's not through being a Baptist. It's not by being a Republican. It's not by the Pope. It's not by Shintoism. It's not by donating to charity. It's none of these things. It's through the blood. The blood of Christ is the dividing point. There is no atonement without the blood of Jesus. Now, let's look at this wonderful word, redemption. In him, we have redemption. The Greek word, and it's a long one. I'll spell it out for you. It's apotoros, and it's spelled this way, A-P-O-L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. Now, this is an important word for the Christian, for the believer. Redemption is an act, literally, of ransom. It's riddance. You've heard the phrase, good riddance, right? Well, this is bad riddance. In other words, get rid of it. Riddance to the old self, to sin. Riddance. The root word, the root meaning of this word redemption goes back to off, away, tied in with price. So, Your sin, your transgression is off away, but it's tied in with a price. This is all tied into this wonderful word, redemption. The verse goes on, talks about the forgiveness of our trespasses. Could you be more thankful for that S at the end of that? (laughs) Trespasses, (laughs) right? Not just the fact that you murdered somebody, but every bad thought, every jealousy, every point of anger. I mean, all our trespasses. That is so important to me, and I know it is to you too. Trespasses, the forgiveness of our trespasses. It talks about the riches 
of his grace. In other words, are you aware of this? We're being prepared for heaven. You, you knew this, right? I mean, if you're born again, you're being prepared for heaven. Everything that the Christian goes through and every trial and every sorrow and every trouble is really just preparing us to be in God's presence and to adore him and understand him and love him all the more. The riches of his grace, rich grace, not just greasy grace, right? Rich grace, deep, thorough, complete, full. Do you need all of God's grace? I do. I I need the whole thing, the whole riches of his grace. Let's look at verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all Wisdom and insight, which he lavished upon us. Oh, this word lavish. Such a great word, lavished. Here's another Greek word, and I've got to put them in here. It does help us. It's perisso, spelled P-E-R-I-S-S-E-U-O, P-E-R-I-S-S-E-U-O. And it means to cause to superabound, lavished. Above and beyond, <laughs> superfluous, yeah, all these meanings. In other words, is beyond what you could imagine, which he lavished upon us. Bottom line, God has dumped on us. Is, is that in the vernacular enough for you? He's dumped on us. I'm going to tell a little story, and you may have heard this. I don't think you've heard this one before. Maybe you have. But I've been a pastor for a number of years, and one of the churches I was pastoring, we had a, a church that was really on fire. This church, we decided to have a visitor come to sing for us, and his name was Michael Card. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of Michael Card. You haven't? Have you ever heard of a song called, Michael Card wrote a song, Amy Grant made it famous. El Shaddai, that's one. It's one of the ones that Michael Card wrote, but he wrote El Shaddai. Everybody thinks Amy Grant wrote it. She didn't. She just sang it. But Michael Card wrote the song, and he wrote a number of beautiful songs besides El Shaddai. And we invited him to come to our church. But we made a decision, the leadership of the church, that we were going to treat him as if he was Jesus. Jesus, I mean, uh, honor him in the same way, not call him Jesus, but treat him in such a way that he was going to be so blessed, (laughs) and we wanted to lavish on this guy, (laughs) and and we made a decision to do it up big for him, and and we just decided to do this. So we did a whole bunch of things with Michael, and I found out years later he still remembered them. He drove up in his van with his, with his team, you know, you know, the techs and the different guys. And so 12 of the men of the church went out and surrounded the van. I don't know if he thought he was getting robbed or what, but they surrounded the van and, and wouldn't let him carry anything or any of the guys carry anything. And we took all the equipment out. We carried their suitcases, everything we could possibly get. And then we put them in cars, all these guys, his team, and took them to their hotel rooms. Now, we took the van. We really did this. <laughs> we took the van, and it was a huge van, and we shampooed it, the carpet, cleaned all the windows inside and out, waxed it, filled it with gas, of course, changed the oil, of course, And, you know, did a whole maintenance thing on his van while they were being taken to their hotel rooms. All the hotel rooms where they were, we had arranged with the manager of the hotel to get into the rooms (laughs) and change all the furniture in the rooms. I mean, we're thinking if the Lord's come, this is how we would want to treat him. And, And so we put all this fancy furniture in the rooms, filled the rooms, all the rooms with cookies and flowers and cakes and all these, you know, hors d'oeuvres, right? And then we had them over for dinner. My wife made a fabulous dinner. But before they came in, they were relaxing because we had a 
stringed ensemble, our live ensemble from our orchestra, playing in the other room. <laughs> so we had a live stringed ensemble. This really happened. A live stringed ensemble. And then just before dinner, we had arranged for Michael's wife to be flown in from Tennessee, unbeknownst to him. So when he sat down to dinner, we had a seat ready, and he wanted to know what that seat was for, and we brought his wife in. We would picked her up at the airport, brought her in, and then, of course, we had a fabulous dinner, which my wife made, and we paid him much more than what he was requiring for his honorarium to do it. I mean... It was a moment that I think speaks of what Christ has done for us. We don't understand the lavishment that's come on us. We can never repay it. As a matter of fact, we can I mean, comprehend how much he's done for us. So the fact that we love each other and do things for each other is a small, small representation of what Jesus has lavished on us. And we're going to get a little bit more into this of how much he's lavished on us. It says, in all wisdom and insight, divine wisdom, that's pretty good, right? Coupled with omniscient insight, those two things coming together to combine the lavishment of our salvation. Let's look at verse 9. It says, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him. So, it says He made known to us. There are three things here that He's made known to us. Three things. The first one is the mystery of His will. world doesn't get it. world doesn't have any idea about Christ. I mean, I'm, the lost are so lost, so blind, so deaf, they don't get it at all. It's actually hidden from them. They don't see it. They don't understand it. And I'm going to go one step further. They don't even want it. It's amazing. <laughs> you know, the world so rejects Christ and Christianity and Everyone's going to have to answer for it someday. Have you ever been going down the road and just look at the back of cars? I do this all the time. Bumper stickers or what's stuck on the windows or what, what the statement of their life is. I mean, it, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, you see, sometimes you'll see skulls and some death symbols. <laughs> you know, sometimes you'll see pets, right? <laughs> I'm my, my uh, Dalmatian's favorite or something. You know, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the stories you read on the back of cars are unbelievable. Uh, I mean, you see stick figures, you might see Trump sign or a Biden sign. I mean, that's the statement of your life? You know, Christ means for our lives to shine with his mystery and his glory. He's made known to us the mystery of the gospel. That's good. Secondly, these are the things he's made known. Second one is his kind intention. His kind intention. The first one is the mystery of his will. The second one is his kind intention. Why would God do this for us? Why would he lavish his redemption on us? You know, I, I think we'll be wondering that forever. <laughs> I mean, why would Christ go to the cross? He didn't have to do that. I mean, why did the Father send his only son? His kind intention. I think that 10 of the attributes of God speak about the kind intention. Now, there's 40 of them. There's probably many more than that, but 40 that we've studied but his kind intention certainly is shown forth by his attribute of love and grace and goodness and mercy. Should I keep going? His compassion, his benevolence, his long-suffering, his wonder, his mystery, 
his eminence, meaning his closeness. The kind intention of God is shown by all these things. Third, he's made known to us that he can purposed in himself, purposed in him. Within Christ is the purpose. You want to know why everything's happening? You want to know why the world is what it is? The purpose is Christ to turn all things to needing him, all things that are empty without him, all things that are filled with him. The purpose of God filled in our creation, in our salvation. You see, I thought it was all about me. Mm, Not really. (laughs) In our maturity, in our completion, in our eternity, all glory, all glory to Jesus. I was in Moscow in a meeting with the underground church, and I'll never forget the moment when I was in an upper room jammed in with these beautiful Christians. They were all on the floor on their knees praying and some singing. And we got ready for the service and I knew about the pastor that he'd spent so much time in prison and so much time under persecution and I stood up and I said, you know, I'm just so honored to be here with Pastor Zinchenko, that was his name. And I said, he's such a wonderful man of God. And I was starting to do this. And all of a sudden, he yanks on my arm. And I lean down, and he whispered in my ear. He says, Brother Paul, please do not do this. All glory goes to Jesus. Isn't that true? I did stop, by the way, <laughs> and started preaching Jesus. But all glory to Jesus. Now, I don't know if you ever heard this kind of a phrase before, but here we go. Neither the Father nor the Spirit are diminished by all glory going to Jesus. Doesn't diminish the Father's glory, doesn't diminish the Spirit's comfort or teaching or his whole aspect of the Trinity and the Godhead, but it's been within the purpose of the Trinity to turn the glory to Jesus not taking anything away from the Father or the Spirit, but everything to Jesus. The skies wait for his return. The graves wait for his voice. The angels wait. For his commands. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. The literal meaning there is upon, upon the fullness of times. So there's an administration of the gospel that comes upon the fullness of the times, upon the last times. Now, this is a strange concept, maybe, for many in the church. But I believe that God is bringing his will together. You can see this worldwide. You can see this with what's going on in Israel. You can see this with what's going on in Iran. You can see this all across the globe. You can see this in the United States with its diminishment, and it is diminishing. But upon the fullness of time, the great administration of the gospel. Now, I believe the opening of Revelation, when it talks about the seven churches of Revelation, I take that to be progressive in time. Now, it doesn't mean those letters weren't delivered to all of those churches, all seven of those churches. But I also think there's something in end times, last times, eschatological implications where those seven churches were really stages also of the church. Now, the first letter was written to who? 
the Ephesian church, okay? So that was the one that was really blowing and going in the first century. But I take them as progressive. The sixth stage of the church is the Philadelphia stage. And many of you have lived during this Philadelphia stage of the church, when the church was blowing and going. I mean, I don't know if you realize the glory that the church was peaking at through the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s as it started to diminish then. I mean, you talk about the great Billy Graham crusades. I mean, the, the wonder of the church, it was growing up on the stage here on the, on the screen is a picture. If you're just listening, I'll tell you what's, what we're showing up here on the stage. But you have President Reagan and behind him these greats of the church standing behind or seated behind him that were taking the gospel hugely to the world. Now, the whole thing collapsed under the Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart and all that stuff that was going on, and it got worse and worse and worse, and it's still gotten worse and worse and worse. But here on the stage, you have Dr. Jerry Falwell Sr., <laughs> Dr. Jerry Falwell, with what he did and his implications of his life. You have... Dr. Ben Armstrong, the executive president of National Religious Broadcasters, my uncle. You have Dr. Bill Bright, largest Christian ministry in the world. You have my dad, my brother Jim's dad, Sandra's father-in-law, Paul Ernest Freed. Each of these men, I know all their names, there's Mr. Bott. You know, there was a bunch of these guys that were broadcasters that were taking the gospel powerfully worldwide. Let's look at it. Turn with me to Revelation. And again, I just want to read about the sixth stage of the Philadelphia stage of the church. Let's look at Revelation. And I'd like to turn to verse 7 and read a few verses here. Revelation 3, verse 7. It says, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut. Boy, if anything really characterized the Philadelphia stage of the church, it was an open door for the gospel. It was blowing and going. Because you have a little power and have kept my word and not denied my name, behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews but are not a lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you. Boy, when you talk about world governments being open to the gospel, it was happening during this stage, I believe, of the church. Because you've kept my word, I'm in verse 10 now. I kept the word of my perseverance. I also keep you from the hour of testing. That's an important phrase. In other words, the Philadelphia church wasn't going to experience the hour of testing. Stay with me. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Boy, when you think of what's going on now, you see what's happening here. I'm coming quickly, hold fast to what you have in order that no one take away your crown. He overcomes, I'll make him pillar in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it anymore and I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, Philadelphia stage of the church. Now we come to the seventh stage of the church, which is where I believe you and I find ourselves, the Laodicean stage of the church. This is important when you talk about end time stuff. You with me? Sort of. Okay. A lot. Okay, good. 
And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, I'm reading from verse 14, right, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, they're neither hot nor cold. I would that you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and I become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined, important word, by fire, that you may become rich and white garments, another important word, that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And I sought to anoint your eyes that you may see, verse 19 finally, those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I believe you and I are experiencing the greatest purging and refining before the greatest event since the resurrection. The Lord is separating. Just turn on the television. It's pretty obvious who are his and who are not. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about church channels or whatever. It, it, it's, it's pretty obvious that this is nothing to do with the spirit. This is entertainment and arrogance and pride, or maybe occasionally it's beauty and humility and godliness. But there's great purging that's coming on, I believe, of a separation between what is really his and what is not. You can sense where the presence is. I'm not saying sense how many people are involved, how many bodies are filling a building. You can fill a building with a football game or a basketball game or whatever. I'm talking about those whose hearts are totally t turned towards him. The greatest happening since the resurrection, where all the graves of the church are opening, and the living, that's you, right? The living of all the church are rising to meet her Savior. And then the loneliness of the world without the church, the true church, and without the presence. Oh, what a moment, what a time. All gone with the exception of the two witnesses. It says the summing up of all things in Christ. The summing up of all things in Christ. I'm still in verse 10. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. It says, in the heavens and things upon the earth. But the literal meaning is not in the heavens. It's upon the heavens. And that's important because, in other words, Christ is seated upon the heavens. The heavens are below him. And the earth is his. The heavens glorifying Jesus. This is coming. And the explosion, we remember Bethlehem's fields where the skies exploded with the angelic proclamation. But soon when it's talking about the summing up of all things in the heavens and things upon the earth, that's talking about worldwide, not just the town of Bethlehem. Worldwide. Let's look finally at verse 11, and we'll conclude. It says, also we have obtained an inheritance. There are four things, and this is obvious, but there are four things that we have inherited. We've inherited, aren't you glad, entrance. We've inherited land rights. We've inherited a title. And we've inherited access, entrance, land rights, title, and access. Do 
you know Christ? Do you? I see that little nod. Okay, good. <laughs> that means you have entrance past that great guardian angel that stands at that massive gate of pearl. There are 12 of them, by the way. And I don't know which one you'll go in through or which one I'll go in through. Interesting concept. <laughs> but entrance into the new Jerusalem, past that guardian angel. You can't just say, I'm going in, I'm a good guy. <laughs> no way. <laughs> past that guardian into the new Jerusalem. Secondly, land rights. It talks about in John 14.2, talks about a mansion, a dwelling place. In other words, you got land rights. That's good. <laughs> land rights in the new Jerusalem. Title. You go, this is no big deal what you're saying. Oh, it isn't. Sonship is not a big deal. Not that title is not big. It's huge to be a daughter. You're a daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ, a daughter of God. That, that's gigantic, that title. Do you agree with that? It is. It's huge to be a daughter, a son, to have the title, the title of royalty. We're actually called a priesthood. The title of judges. Don't listen to the world when it says, you can't judge anything. I can do whatever I want. Really? <laughs> Not so, according to God's word. We're set to judge with him. Judge righteously with him in heavenly places. Rulers, I mean, these are titles, sonship, daughtership, royalty, priesthood, judges, rulers. How about access? That's the fourth one, access. Not just entrance, but access to the wonders of the heavens. Access to communion with the saints. Oh, am I looking forward to being with Paul. <laughs> I just want to sit with the guy. <laughs> Can I just get a, a few years here with you, Paul, <laughs> of your eternity? But I mean, to spend time with Elijah or Elisha, to talk to Adam, what was it like to be clothed by Christ in the garden? Would that mean anything to you? What was it like in the garden, by the way? I, I mean, just to spend time with these greats, Deborah, with her great victories, or Mary. I mean, think of the wonders of just spending fellowship time with the redeemed of the ages. Oh, such a wonderful access. But all of that pales, of course. All of that pales before fellowship with Jesus. Just to be with Jesus. Mm. access to the throne of God, where there you stand before the throne without being cast away, without being sent to the lake forever before the throne and have access to the lavish wonder of our redemption. It says, having been predestined according to his purpose. The whole purpose for the few. Are you one of them? The whole purpose for the few, the predestined ones, is to fulfill God's purposes. And finally, it says, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Oh, the great counsel of the Trinity, the counsel of the Godhead, purposing all things to bring glory to Christ and to bestow on you and me his lavish redemption. God bless you.